Welcome. This is a December 6th Jalen Zones call. We have Antrenig, DCH, Dan, Jamie, Chris, Jan, Jörg, myself, Michael. And we've been struggling with some technical difficulties. But here's a quick uh, programming note. Uh, Doug R., who has been working on OCI container specs and implementations, cannot meet during the slot. So DCH and I reached out to him. and Dave reached out. I reached out about scheduling. So we'll probably meet this Friday at the same time slot. So I will make an announcement for that. When you have three calls, make it four. Uh, Chris, how is your audio situation? Okay. Better? Awesome. Is Much it better? better? Yes, sir. All right. So, um, yeah, so the slides and the recording of the Enterprise Working Group call is actually online on YouTube already. I also posted the links on the previous DYK. And I think one of the learning and understanding that came out of the call is, as you rightfully pointed out and on the Google mailing list, which is now also moving to the actual official uh, FreeBSD mailing list, but there is a separate mailing list now for the Enterprise Working Group. And on this uh, group, you rightfully pointed out that um, there is a bit of a uh, potential mismatch between what the Enterprise Working Group kind of started out with having input from, let's say, a single enterprise stakeholder and contrasting to, to the perception that uh, have been gained during the recent or probably a lot of uh, calls over the last few years, that uh, it might be worthwhile to have a deeper conversation on what the uh, particular focus points should be in terms of jails and beehive. So if there is time today to dig into that, I would love to continue the conversation. Yeah. I am all good for that, also add... partly to blame for any pointing out of any potential mismatch. Um, I do want to address anyone else's topics before we go into any of the deeper dive topics. And for example, uh, there was an email exchange from uh, Antony. Did you put that in? Yes, sir. And is that jail specific? Yes, sir. Chris, let's hold on, hold off on that topic unless you're pressed for time, and let's dive into this uh, Dev One. I'm going to reduce your font here. Jail topic because Jamie may have some insights. Ooh, and there's more jail topics. So, Chris, is that fine with you? Cool. So, uh, tell us about this blog post and Dev One news. Yes, beauty of writing blog posts is then you get emails once a week about them. And today I got an email from Pedro who said that he has integrated this part of my blog, which runs Dev1 as a jail. Most importantly, compared to every other Linux jail implementation out there, uh, I actually boot the thing. Like, you know, you can start services in it. Uh, for example, for a very long time, every other jail manager, if you told it to create an Ubuntu jail, the command would be just set to bin true. Just like, oh, really? oh it's bin true. And oh. there's no process run it, running inside of it, right? So that was kind of sad. I, 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 I thought that that was half-baked and started thinking, okay, we have a problem with system D because it requires to be PID1. Uh, go ahead but... and explain briefly how Dev1 differ, differs from Debian. Yes, so Dev1 was born out of the system D fiasco, uh, where all of the old graybeard Unix guys, including me, but I don't have much of a graybeard, were like, uh oh, we don't like system D. We would like to use literally any init system that we want, because that, that that's that that's how Debian was initially. I mean, it it came with uh, I think it was upstart, but you could also use any other init system without any problem. Um, so the, 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 the old guys were like, okay, we don't like this. And a lot of young guys like me were like, okay, we're moving to free BSD. Thank you very much. And then dev one was created as a, uh, more Unixy, uh, environment, uh, for, uh, more Unixy Linux system. So what dev one does is that it allows you to use, um, upstart or sysv in it or open RC. 
In my implementation, I specifically use OpenRC because it, it, it works very nice. Uh, uh, that that's system five in it. Although I think it can, you can also use you can also use uh uh you know run it, you you can just run it as well. But basically, whatever is available, you can use it on, on uh, on uh, on Dev One. Uh, so you know it's 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 a purely very Unix C system. Um, I, okay. I'm using OpenRC because I know it best. Uh, due to my years at the Gen Two project, and uh, now I can completely boot up a uh, Dev One machine or any other Open RC based system. So Alpine Linux, um, let's say, um, any other system could be booted in in here as well. The beauty of Dev One is that it, it takes its packages from Debian, so you will not be thinking, "Oh, I'm going to be lacking a package." Let's say you know Alpine project is tiny, and the goal is not to provide all the packages, but to rather provide a hypervisor system, similar to what CoreOS was, right? That's the goal of Alpine, but you don't want that. You want a you want a general purpose Unix system, but you can't run Debian, Debian, because of the system D fiasco, and your solution to that is okay. I'm just going to use Dev One, which is Debian with uh, with the init freedom that I need. Um, so if people still think that system D was a good idea, here's the proof that it was a bad idea. It, it literally break interoperability between operating system. So yeah. Do you find that the packages are heavily dependent on system D or are they generally um, working out of the box? On my experience, there are packages that might require lib system D, which I'm okay with, no problem there. That also could happen on literally any other Unix system as well. I think we might have a similar scenario on FreeBSD where they're like GNOME was very much a lib, lib system D dependent for a long time. But please correct me if I'm young, if I'm wrong, because I use Window Maker. I'm, 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 I kind of don't use any fancy things. But yeah, it, that's the scenario, but it doesn't require system D to be running anyway. Uh, it just uses some parts of his libraries or whatever. Um, on Dev1, I never had any issue when I am uh, when I am um, uh, installing a package, even though if if it required libsystemd, so and running it inside the jail. So we, we've been very happy there, and this is all obviously the correct road to go to uh, uh, having Docker images run on having Docker images to run on uh, FreeBSD. Uh, of course, if the image is based on Ubuntu, you're kind of, you know, not, not in a good place already. But luckily, most of the package, most of the uh, most of the Docker packagers these days are using tinier things like Alpine or or something else. So, so something is very mini compared to something as massive as Ubuntu. So we're kind of lucky there. Um yeah, that's that's the whole story. So Pedro emailed me that he was also able to integrate my blog post configs into um, Bastille. Of course, I told him I don't use Bastille. I have my own GL manager. And uh, that, that so, was the, 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 the generated final jail can conf ba on Bastille. So when you say Pedro, is Pedro related to Bastille? Pedro is a contributor to Bastille. Got it. Uh, then I'll and, add an, uh, someone needs to mute. Thank you. Um, any questions for Antrenig? So just just two things. The, the sort of canonical use case for this sort of stuff is people want to go, um, uh, you know, Docker pull start type thing. And mm -hmm. for those things, the first um, sort of thing that people want to pull is their application. The second one then is some sort of database. And I guess for that, you have to have systemd, otherwise your Postgres won't start. So it sort of requires, you can you can run your Linux jails, but you're still having to rework your application to fit um, a non-systemd environment. The fact that it's a FreeBSD flavored, not systemd did run, isn't kind of really any different, is it? I could swear Postgres existed before systemd, but I could easily be wrong. <laughs> oh, totally, but I'm but I'm just saying when you when you when you do your Docker pull stuff, it'll come probably by default as a system D flavored thing. I see. Got it. Yeah. A big up On the other hand, uh, free desktop related, they have a nasty habit of uh, making optional system D non optional after half a year. 
Interesting. Do you have an example project that did that? Or oh, anything GNOME related has lots LXC. of things where they did it. Yep. So it starts out. Uh, don't worry. It's just it's just an option. You don't have to use. Yeah, we're deprecating that and removing it the next time around. And no, we won't uh, accept maintenance patches. Uh, fork it if you don't like it. Hmm. Uh, happened a few times. It happened once with LXC, and there was so much backlash from the Gentoo LXDE, community. LXDE, not LXC, LX, right? So, so, yeah, I heard a few things. LXDE, okay, thank you. <laughs> LXDE, sorry, I'm so sorry. Yes, LXDE, I'm so sorry. I, I it's a journey. The container manager. Yeah, there, there was such a massive pushback from the Gentoo community. Like, the reason why you go to Gentoo is you want to have control. That they're like, okay, fine, we're, we're, bringing, we're bringing it back with, like, non-systemd things. So um, th that, that was a whole scenario there. Um. Yeah. Is 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 there system D on OpenBSD? They they had an idea once there. No. <laughs> just, they just started to. Uh, I think they uh, have their own. Um, because they don't shim use layer. M BSD off shim for some of the user session management stuff because they can't uh, use the existing uh, PEM code, so they had to write their own stuff anyway, because they still use uh, BSDI style. Yes. Uh, of education. And uh, I am currently working thanks to the knowledge that I gained with working on Super V. Now that I know the internals of Runit, now I'm working on integrating Runit with Jails to boot as well. We've had a scenario like this before at our company internally where we would boot Void Linux, but then the shutdown had issues. And now that I know what the issues are, after learning a bit more about run it. So now I'm looking to blog post maybe next week on how to run void Linux and boot it, not just build it, but also boot it uh, inside the jail properly with running all the services. I think void is a cleaner option compared to dev one because void never had a, um, never had a, a system D dependency as in, 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 in its legacy. It, it comes from a very net BSD background anyway. Uh, let's see, you've got a, a link there, Jan. That is us. Yes, yeah, the, this jail demon is not the mystical jail D which we've been talking about here, <laughs> but uh, it's just a little helper basically for the jail processes to uh, uh, request some kind of functionality from the host, which could be restarting the jail. That's a canonical use case for this. It's old. Uh, because the problem isn't new and it's a solution to that and you could easily hook that into uh, the just forward uh, run it SV command for the jail so that the jail can basically mm -hmm. have its run it service be restarted. Yes. And that so that you, yeah, another way would be to use something maybe S6 sudo could also be used for this which is it would be even more flexible, but yeah. Again, it's the tools are there, and the mechanism exists. Now it is about making the policy so that it's easy to consume, and not for, just I have some code here. <laughs> for 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 run it specifically uh, and void Linux, I ended up writing a tiny etcrc file because it doesn't ship with. Uh, Void Linux and my etcrc itself call, calls run it and throws it into the background, and then it you know it kills itself and then but there's another process that does the monitoring for run it as it's supposed to do um, and it it works fine I didn't have any issues the shutdown also works properly although in case of run it and correct me if I'm wrong if you send a kill not a kill but a term rather to the uh, run it process it will know okay I need to shut down and it cleans itself you know, gracefully and everything. And shut uh, down depends the Depends on which process you're sending it to. So, um, run it puts the logging pipe into the supervisor process, the, uh, not the meta supervisor. So, so that means that if you restart the supervisor, you kind of lose your logging pipe, but it gets recreated. It's just that anything in the pipe buffer is lost. Mm. And if you send the, uh, uh, supervisor command uh, um, a sick term, it will restart, but it will be restarted unless the, so the, the supervisor mm -hmm. will be restarted if it's part of a proper supervision tree. 
So mm. very, yeah, it's a very um, thorough shutdown, a bit more thorough than you probably want to. You probably want to instead use the supervisor to send a signal to the child process it's uh, supervising. You do that through the S double, uh, SV command, so SV uh, term, and then uh, unless it gets a term, it's expected to exit, but in theory, a process could just ignore the signal or have mm -hmm. a signal handler which doesn't exit. In that case, you have to become more aggressive and send it a kill or some other fatal signal. And then normally it would get restarted by its dedicated supervisor. You can prevent that by either changing the runtime state of the supervisor to not restart it with SP once. Or if you want that to persist, you can also put a file name just down in the uh, service directory. And then the next time the supervisor starts, the supervisor will, will start. start, but it will not start the service. Yes. So okay. that basically the infrastructure to supervise the service is prepared. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's but, what I use uh, in that's what I use in Super V, like you told me. Okay. Yes. Let's deep dive that a little later. Um and cover a little more breadth for a moment. Um, let's see, Jorg, any news on audio or shall we jump into Antonig's poll about relying on FreeBSD 14, if I'm reading that correct, for Jailer? <clears throat> shall I interpret this as a poll? You're asking if it's I'd like a safe feedback, yes. <laughs> to do so. Go ahead. T tell us your use case and rationale. So I'm loving the include basically. And um, uh, for those who don't know, Jailer does patch. If, you, if you're running below 13, 14, it will patch your RCD jail file, which, which, which we kind of had to do because there were some features that we were not able to push properly. Obviously, we keep the old jail file. Um, and FreeBSD is like smart enough to know, oh, there are two jail services. One of them is called jail.backup. The other one's called jail... So it's like, okay, I run the jail. I don't need to run the jail.backup anymore, even though it, it provides the same thing in the provide flag or the provide variable. So we're loving that. And since I'm loving that, I'm like, okay, officially should the jailer be like, hey, 14 and up only, no more 13 or anything, which is what I'm asking in here. Because I, I, I've seen scenarios where people are like still running 12. Here I'm shaming myself because I still run the 12th branch of the... Of, of, of the project so yeah what do you um, know about your user base is it anyone on the call is it a handful of like big use big users who have reasons to stay on 12 or 13 for a while oh and Jan, you asked the same question nice so uh, <clears throat> so so 13 users yes there are 12 users no they're not and as far as i know most of the people who use jailer they usually update very I'm, I'm like the last person to update in my circles probably should uh, yeah. yeah um but but at the same time i the reason why i'm asking this is now that include is there and my next question is about jailer file we're we're not focusing anymore on jailer itself uh, we're focusing on the ecosystem around Jailer. For example, currently a team member is writing an Ansible module that you can use for Jailer. And someone else is going to write an, uh, a, a, a Terraform module that you can use with Jailer, right? So we're like, okay, the, the Jailer itself is good enough to create and build and start and stop a jail, which is basically what every other jail manager has been able to do for a long time. But the problem why we are not able to move forward and compete with the other Linux solutions is the lack of integration with uh, the ecosystem that developers and ops use. Like the first one that we wrote that currently does exist, although you can shame me because I did not open source it, is BuildBot, one of the most famous uh, uh, pipe, pipe, pipeline uh, management systems, so very similar to Jenkins. Even uh, uh, personally, I think it's better than Jenkins. Every major project uses BuildBot, not Jenkins. CLang, for example, LLVM, Clang, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, Gen2, et cetera. Everyone uses BuildBot. So now you can hook uh, Jailer into BuildBot. You don't need to run shell commands. Instead, there's a BuildBot module for Jailer. And now your 
your testing process that you used to do on Docker now can be done in Jailer, right? So, so we think that the next appropriate approach here is to build the ecosystem, not the software itself, because the software is stable enough. So why I'm telling you all of this, because the people who tend to use these kind of uh, systems like Ansible and and then and, 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 and the build bot and whatnot, they don't update very much. Apple's official build bot is still running on like the 10 year old version. Like that, that's been deprecated for 10 years. So, uh, you know, even major corporations don't tend to update these things. I, I can't imagine what would happen in other enterprises who who would be the target of Jailer. Does, does that make sense? Well, uh, community-wise, well, you know your community best. As for feature-wise with Occam BSD, when 14 introduced the native release engineering Z root on ZFS image generation support, that meant that my script lost like 300 lines of handcrafting the same thing. So mm -hmm. when you can leverage the underlying OS, I say do it because at the same time you showcase the OS and make, if anything, just be super clear on the documentation on if you're on 13 and need to move to 14, do this. So it's your call and I, you know your product best, you know your, your software best and your community best, but Again, are there any jailer users on the call? Show of hands, show of hands. Not that I'm aware of. So um, while people think about their answer, jailer file, tell us more about that. Yes, um, two points for the context. And uh, Dave, your input might be massive here. I think that the idea of a Docker hub is dumb. We've seen a lot of issues there, specifically with uh, like, how are you going to even keep the finance to run something as big as Docker Hub? Uh, it's it's not a it's it's not a viable business model. So um, so for for Linux users, that's kind of weird. But for us, you know, BSD users, well, the package model is not the only model. There's also the ports model, where you know you ship the 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 recipe to build a package in this case you ship the recipes to build uh, you know jails uh jails that have mysql in them jails that have the one that we're using right now is the elk stack so it's Elasticsearch, log stash and uh, uh kibana in a single jail right all, all configured pre-configured for you so, um, uh, but at the same time, because I know Dave's going to go in that, you know, the, the, the importance of the importance of uh, uh, what do you call that? The importance of uh, something like OCI images, which are already ready. We all also now have a bunch of um, helper scripts where your jails can be exported into ZFS uh, streams or tarballs and can be shipped into a, a pre defined format to an nginx directory and then any other parts of your infrastructure can use that as its endpoint so now you're not downloading freebsd14 you're downloading freebsd14 elk stack right uh, so like basically we're giving people ports and pudrier but we're not giving them package <laughs> um uh, yes Jan. one thing we can do is make the tools easy to install by turning them into a port and thereby into a package so that all the tooling is just a package install away. And for something small, I see no conflict with basically having a port and thereby again a package for the built in instructions. Of course, if you have tens of gigabytes uh, or even hundreds of gigabytes of images, the uh, port maintainers and uh, CDN team will. Uh, and you down if you try to submit lots of multi gigabyte uh, packages to the existing build infrastructure because uh, yeah that's not nice but what you can easily do is just make the tooling available and then even just a, maybe have a git repository somewhere with the redirections to the other git repositories so that you don't basically make it easier to consume uh, it's also a trust question because 
normally these kind of tools is the package or whatever kind of file source is configured, it's trusted. Uh, but yeah, it would probably be the easiest just basically use it to point to your own Git repository and then have indirections mm. from there. If, so for something like potluck or stuff like this, it doesn't have to be hundreds of gigabytes of uh, frequently changing files uh, just for a minimum viable tooling. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, if you are careful, you can make it so that it's CDN and replication friendly. Um, one tool which is sadly underutilized, but could be very valuable if you, uh, for handling updates, if you design your format correctly, is mm -hmm. something called uh, Zsync. It's basically a pre-computable rsync algorithm so that you have your file and basically the server side of the uh, rsync uh, data algorithm pre-computed and it has at least deflate compression uh, awareness oh. so that you can have deflate compressed tar files and you can use an old version of the tar file to get the rsync efficiency uh, when it comes to bandwidth but what you're actually hosting are just read-only static tarballs and a little file next to it. So you have just two files and it's just HTTP range request. So something oh, any nice. CDN can handle. Mm. Uh, something like that uh, would be a good idea. Certainly uh, the way it's done right now with FreeBSD packaging tools uh, kind of raised a lot of potential there, but spending the limited developer times on other things, which are mm -hmm. more important to those who spend their time on it. But there's a lot to be said for basically having a smart binary diffing algorithm with a few heuristics so that you can use the last version of a package to update to the next several versions. Oh, okay. Uh, that makes much more sense than what I have in mind. Don't have to yes. have a per request computation, but basically pre-compute something reasonable so that let's say I have a big package like Chromium and I missed three uh, pod updates because my uh, backup computer was uh, in storage or something. I turn it on, I update it and it would basically look at things, find out that it can fast forward by just loading and applying three diffs instead of uh, doing the full download, or you could use something like uh, IPFS does, which is what uh, would be a good infrastructure for an image distribution system, because it also had its uh, untrustworthy caches by having uh, basically self-authenticating data. So because mm. everything is addressed by content hash, uh, uh, it matches the content hash, it's cryptographically verified if the hash was correct, that the content okay. your untrustworthy peer gave you. And the other nice thing is that anyone could just pin a reference to the content and then you have a mm. local replica. So if you have a, your own on-site service uh, and then you could just use this and access it via HTTP. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, you could even point uh, the existing libpkg stuff at it. Just yeah. have your own package repository with big ass packages. And, and uh, yes, um, work out of the yes, box. Merkle, and, uh, Merkle hash trees. Yes, Merkle hash trees uh, and formats designed in such a way to uh, reuse mm. as much as possible between uh, stuff. Mm. And sometimes you can't really do the most. Uh, bandwidth efficient things by go, uh, limiting yourself to basically chunked uh, snapshots, but you have to be clever about finding the difference between snapshots and expressing it in as small as a way as possible. For example, if you have big software like Chromium, you have to have a diffing algorithm which knows how to guess where the offsets in machine code are so that it can basically see that this function hasn't completely changed 
it has just been relocated in the file and mm -hmm. it only has to basically encode patch all of the things which look like jump or call instructions up instead of and move this range of the file around. Okay, it's that's not the fastest algorithm to do, but it uh, has a giant payout if you get it right. Can you both? It's almost like um, someone could write a thesis on that and then <laughs> well, it has been done. And an operating system. Thesis have been written on smart uh, binary. Oh, trust me, uh, I, I'm pulling your leg. I know this. I know this. <laughs> I know this. Yes. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's, that was Colin's work earlier. Yeah. My, no, my, uh, but... so, so my back. To go back to my original question, why I gave all the whole context of the you know port model, not the package model, etc. Um, so my uh, uh, question was my problem rather is this that every jail manager uses the same syntax as Docker, as in their building process is using the somewhat close to the uh docker syntax you know run this run this expose that entry point that and their uh uh you know docker compose similar to infrastructure is using a very similar thing that docker compose uses which is yaml which i mean i don't know how it got famous it's like the chrome of markup languages mm -hmm. it got very famous <laughs> but it's yeah. still the worst one out there honestly um so i i ended up uh, that my jailer file is going to have more like a dtrace language layout because it relies on hooks. Uh, so it's going to be very awk-like as an AWK-like. But I'm still not able to figure out what would be the perfect um, uh, syntax for building sim something similar to Docker Compose. Okay, can you three not... make the Friday call at the same time? Because that sounds like a perfect topic for an OCI-related deep dive rather than uh, pure jail, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I probably can't make Friday because um, I'm in Germany for, for four days. So, uh, oh, nice. But I, yeah, I'll see how I go. But anyway, I already, I already talked to Doug, so I have a head start. So I want this conversation to plant seeds in your heads on, you know, what that can look like. So almost on to keep the questions yeah. coming like, okay, so how do we produce better than Docker YAML if that was sort of an accidental success? Yeah. yeah or like any, 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 any thing that you've ever seen in your life. Like I'm just throwing thoughts out there. Like you think XML was a good idea. Just throw it, throw an idea. So I can go into and start searching like, okay, what would be the best scenario for, yeah. you know, jail or compose, quote unquote. So for me, the number one thing is the file has to be programmably parsable. And for me, this is the big attraction of, of UCL or if I'm forced to YAML. The problem with YAML is that there's many different YAMLs. So you've got to pick <laughs> the right. You know, there's YAML 1, there's YAML 1.1, there's YAML 1.2, and those are very, very different. Um, but for me, this this programmability is really important. So as someone who uses the ports tree a lot, what you notice is that make files are cool, but they're not programmable. So mm -hmm. um, you, you can't um, do verification of the syntax, um, anything like that. Uh, and that's where UCL comes, or, or JSON, or, or YAML. Mm -hmm. all, all three of those allow you to have a um, okay, uh, like a, like a schema that you can validate against, and that's yeah. really important when what we're effectively doing is receiving the untrusted input from a user and building a thing based on that spec. Um, we need to we need to parse it. Does it pass this the, the pass the specification? Oh it's good, then we can parse it on, we can hand it over to the application that develops it. Um, Which brings me to yeah. a qu yeah. question to Jamie. Uh, Jamie, I is Jamie still here? I hope he is. Yeah I'm, I'm yes, still here. Uh, Jamie, I had a question. So the jail dash E uh, flag, which does parsing and printing, uh, mm -hmm. it only parses and prints the things that jail needs. But like if there is an internal variable defined, like let's say dollar ID, it, it doesn't print those. Is that by design, or like can we you know change an if condition and get those printed as well? Because I I think there's a value, but I mean you, you would be. The, the the person who knows more about that actually so like, i would not uh -huh. be that part of the command was added by somebody else okay okay 
Okay. Do, and do, do you think there's a valid point to do into doing that? Because I would like to like just get all the IDs using using the jail command, you know, instead of I mean, forcing it, it with Lua. <laughs> it seems reasonable. I don't know if that would pollute whatever the use case was for. Yeah, that kind of just appeared one day. I don't even remember who who put that in, but uh... got it. Um, what was the exact feature was put that just appeared? For jail managers to be able to do a bit more uh, by default without having to duplicate configuration. Um, the problem is that what I would like to see is just that the jail command basically, when you start a jail, uh, it stores the, you, the at the time configuration somewhere in var run jail or something, so that basically it preserves the configuration because it sometimes happens that just through fat fingers you delete the jail configuration file before you stop the jail. And then good luck figuring out in a, okay, of course it can be done by hand, but then you really mm. have to figure out, okay, which file systems do I have to unmount? Um, and oh, that's a good what point. did I do on behalf of that? Are there any sim links, are there null are there other things? And it would just be nice if the jail command then, oh, I have a, I have a startup configuration safe. There is no more configuration. I will just use that and it doesn't have to preserve the source code. It just has to be, produce equivalent configuration state if passed back. So if every macro is expanded, it's not nice for human readability, but it doesn't hurt the tooling use case. Hmm. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. It, uh, I mean, that actually- R, is or basically, as you delete that file, knows configuration anything yeah. else related to that beyond a separate deep dive on another call no and more questions on my end i got a lot of value today thank you all very much of course the brain trust is active uh you are for what it's worth you're working audio and do you want to introduce yourself briefly you're new to the calls and we welcome new participants we try to no worries um and i totally forgot welcome to what appears to be the 81st call that i've been recording for production users uh, so Process supervision, is there anything urgently to discuss or shall we do that in the less formal later nether regions of the call? Chris, uh, initiative alignment, uh, it's, it's, I'm so glad that the enterprise working group is formalizing things that maybe should have been formalized one or two decades ago. So it's better late than never. And things like the recent um, vendor summit were just spectacular because you have engineers telling passionate stories about their use of free BSD at scale. And it's not a sales pitch. And when you say vendor, that doesn't mean sales pitches. So kudos to everyone involved with that. So, uh, uh, if you haven't watched that video that popped up on the, over the last call, there was this wonderful moment where, uh, let's see, it was Patrick Housen who said, I mean, we're dead if we don't have TPM pass-through or emulation. And I was a little taken back. I'm like, look at the release notes. It's in 14. Like, okay, so what do we have to do to get on the same page to align all these different forces that are looking at the same challenge and problems? And so... Step one alone, as I'll say again, is just the fact that they are formalizing this whole notion that there are enterprise users, they have special needs, they are unique in that they can provide resources and hopefully they're loyal sponsors of the foundation of BSD can of other great things. So Chris, I guess what feedback do you have from all that where folks like Jamie can think, wow, I have these larger users who have clear needs, but they're also articulating those needs clearly. They're occasionally offering testing and funding. And 
wow, they're rewarding our efforts rather than simply saying, hey, Docker's better, jail sucks, whatever. And one small point on that uh, vendor summit was that, what was it? Uh, most Linux fans are not truly developing with it over many years. They're not living with it. They're just seeing the surface of it and saying, hey, this is all perfect. And then it can be death by a thousand cuts from there. So uh, Jamie, hopefully that sets you in the right uh, direction. So other other thoughts, Chris, rather. Great. So um, I think the, the, the main challenge that I am having at the moment is obviously uh, I have the statement from Greg where he basically invites us to, you know, compile this idea of a minimum viable product, which is kind of, you know, great for the enterprise space where you can market that and you have a small piece of work that shows progress and it is something that people are waiting for and then you have the achievement, you can celebrate that and you move to the next piece of work. And really, that is great. Unfortunately, I think most of you guys on the call probably are aware that this is not how things usually work uh, when it comes to an operating system. And now I think the challenge is really understanding where do we have issues or, or, or work that can actually bring a benefit and a value to both enterprise users as well as the project at the end of the day. And as I stated on, on, on the mailing list, I think I think there is no no easy answer to that question. You know, I think we may be able to identify a couple of points by having conversations like this, where we identify pain points and then by having some sort of agreement by a majority of people that, okay, those are the items that we want to work on. And you mentioned documentation, you mentioned how to bring people, you know, on the, on the, on the same page in regards of the capabilities of Beehive and JLs and, and FreeBSD in general. And I, I, I can't agree, I can't count the number of conversations I've had around FreeBSD and, you know, this marketing gap that we've also discussed on these calls multiple times, you know, how much money do you put into marketing for your PC to enterprise users, to general users, who's the audience? And I'm blabbering really, because I think at the end of the day, I kind of already stated the, 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 the task at hand is really figuring out what is there that we think needs movement, needs or unfreezing maybe because maybe some something is already under, under work. Um, it's not to say that we need to create something new and highlight that and and then basically go back to Greg as he pointed right as he rightfully pointed out, you know, there there might be budget to um to help to help out if that is necessary. And uh, on top, yeah. I don't know if jail has painful problem reports slash bugs like Beehive does. For example, then the example I gave was the AMD IOMMU is kind of broken. And I reached out to Anish about that. Hopefully he's still in those circles. But uh, that's where at least we have the, the communal bugzilla bug tracking mechanism to say N number of people uh, maybe just one person reporting and says they're the only one Im impacted or many people say, hey, we got to fix this, that while it might not be what most uh, project planners hope to see from a marketing gap perspective, but it's very tangible, very close to home and very measurable. So I do hope we can, you know, formalize within problem report tracking what is out there that is a blocker, what is causing pain, as as the, the, they love to use the term pain. Well, there are some pain surrounding, for example, an IOMMU. It's not very sexy, but it's important to some users. Um, and these are 
can be very security sensitive and reliability sensitive portions of the kernel. If you got a VM wrong or a jail even wrong, you could own the host from that that contained environment. So uh, we 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 very much need the brightest brains in the community within reach and perhaps compensated for making this all work because you get it wrong and uh, any pain we have will be of the scale of say the ZFS bug or larger where, oh, we we lose your data and we own your system. We don't want to be there. So um, let me think. I'd love to hear from other, oh, hey, there's a bunch of chat. What you got? Oh, is that internal to your continuing the parallel conversation? Understood. Uh, the last point is on Let topic me. again, which is that in my opinion, the biggest pain point for Jades is that it's the duplication of effort uh, that basically every, let's say 10th or so, a truly advanced jail user writes their own jail manager from scratch. Um, and there, in a, let's say twice as many don't write one, but their jail.coms grow into a jail manager of sorts, uh, which I've seen both happen to me and uh, neither is really ideal. It would be really valuable and save a lot of wasted, duplicated work to have something which works well on FreeBSD isn't limited to the, yeah, I've proven that I can run a static website with Nginx with, through this tooling, but really that you can handle upgrading non-trivial application through it and share the results with others instead of having to reinvent the, the wheel for yourself because the big enterprise customers may not really mind if they're truly committed to it because it's a fixed cost, basically. But it's a massive overhead to get started on FreeBSD as a hosting platform if you have to get familiar with all the details and then do the work yourself. You get a nice, reliable system in the end if you do it right, but you have to spend so much work on it that it's really prohibitive to smaller organizations and it's an argument against even getting into it as a large organization. Because yeah, you only get uh, the mechanisms and the mechanisms are great, but what you don't get is uh, opinionated enough tooling so that it works for reasonable deployments without having to build it up together. It's similar to how you don't want to run uh, something like Kubernetes and assemble everything from scratch. Instead, if they are like, let's say three or four pre-configured vendor stacks built out of uh, open source components. With FreeBSD, we don't have the vendor stacks. We only have the open source components. <laughs> Which I'd hope is a blessing in so far as it's not competing companies trying to just sort of lock everyone into one or the other. So it's been a weird space to be in. Go ahead. Yeah, but what we're missing is the what we're missing is tooling to make it possible for them to share so your I don't know your next cloud configuration and have others built on top of it and recommend pull requests to you and stuff like this and make it easy to get up and running. I know that you, uh, Michael, that you've seen what can happen if you get it wrong with the TrueNAS plugin system, where you get like two years out of date uh, software installed in a far from ideal manner because someone spent the effort once to get it all running and then the effort was basically abandoned. And then the tooling for it was abandoned as well. But yeah, I know, but you kind of still need this kind of automation, uh, which is more structured than, yeah, you, you can run shell script up at almost every point uh, in the state transitions. <laughs> yeah, then you have uh, the vulnerability and fragility of stringly type masses with no schema. <laughs> It's powerful, it's flexible, but it's a completely um, 
Um, I think that is also, may I, may I jump in here really quickly? Because I think yes. this is, you're, you're raising a very valid point. That has, that has also uh, been one of the key points initially uh, in, the, in the originating uh, feedback that we got from, from Michael Olipov, at least I'm reading it this way, that, you know, we have for jails all sorts of ports uh, that, I mean, and we have active ones like Bastille and, and, and uh, IOKH, I think is also still active. And then there's all sorts of other ports that were active in the past, but eventually they were abandoned. And now people are stuck with that if they ever use that. And there is no definitive or, or I don't know, there's not a single recommended uh, tool that, that, that people can go to. That's the usual problem, you know. I think, was it you or may, maybe Michael mentioned that before? When people come to the problem, they don't know which tool to choose. They choose one, and then they realize later on that it was the wrong one, because for the setting mm. that they are looking at, they should have chosen <clears> the <throat> other one. But the core of the problem is, is fundamentally is that um, Linux distributions are an operating system, and FreeBSD is a toolkit for building products that happens to be quite usable as an operating system. And for me, that's the fundamental difference. And so we see this all over FreeBSD that people have built the part they need to build their product, and that's where it stops. And what we're asking here is um, how do we bridge that um, toolkit approach where um, – the expectation is you've hired someone who knows free BSD reasonably well and because you're building some sort of product and then you pulled your pieces on top of it. It might be a Juniper, it might be a Dell. Um, you know, those are the <clears throat> sorry, those are the big users who've contributed a lot of this work. Um, and what we have to do is find a way to bridge that to what I think of as the documentality. I sit down, I pull a thing, I share it with someone else, this uh, sharing model of building uh, of building these toolkits uh, and I don't think that's obvious so for me to go forward from here I see kind of two or three big pieces one of them is to continue the work here on defining um, what the, the bits we want looks like this is the people who know the toolbox already and say it needs a spanner and, and a screwdriver and this other thing here to do jails the second bit then is to look at it from a usability perspective and say the Docker model of sharing stuff has worked very well. What would that look like um, for an MVP using as much as possible of the tools we already have in, in FreeBSD package and so forth um, for sharing things? And three, how do I fit those two pieces together? I think they're quite separate things. So one of them is social, one of them is a toolbox, and the other one is how to, how to, how to close the gap. Uh, thought a bit about this between the last few calls, and yeah, it's both a social and community issue to get people to contribute. It's not a purely technical problem; it cannot be solved purely technical. But uh, there can be technical hurdles in the way preventing such an effort from having a chance to be successful. And I think such a the infrastructure required to enable such contributions has to go into ports because putting it into a base before it's completely finished and won't change would be too much of a barrier to entry and to contribution because you would have the same issue as contributing code to FreeBSD, which is not as high as for other operating systems, but it's too high to contribute changes to this. And there's a yeah, sure, little downside sure. to having it live in ports because if you have a problem installing a port or package, sorry to tell you, but you're not the target audience if you can't run package install. Um, either because you don't have the uh, permissions in your organization or because you don't know how. Uh, in both cases, you're not the target audience yet, at least. So um, and then the... Rest has to grow next to it. It shouldn't even attempt to be the canonical way, just the way to work together and yeah, make it easier to reuse things and get validate configurations and so on. And this, there should probably be a few ch little changes to the base system and stuff, but only enough to to provide maybe missing hooks and a lot of the 
places to hook into are there. What is missing with the uh, meta hook to then forward that to something structured instead of just shell code. State tracking, you've you've convinced me of that. And the very yeah. first call was dominated with Dave saying, "Hey, where's my state machine?" And that's where if those those geo managers can be in whatever language you want and may a thousand flowers bloom. However, they're relying on robust standardized plumbing to work with. So I think that's part of the failure. It's like, well, no set of shell scripts will solve underlying potentially kernel level resource issues. So thank Jan, I want to thank you for so many efforts of yours to create helpers, to create uh, an identification of what, the real world state tracking looks like because it's easy to misunderstand that. And so many of these tools can start up great, launch your jail or VM and hallelujah. But when something goes wrong or it's missing a device during startup, well, how do we unwind as much as necessary, correct the problem and move forward? And so uh, that's my take on it. No one wants these tools to stink. No one wants them to go uh, stale. No one wants them to be hard to use. No one wants that. We're not. We're not here to like explicitly set out to make them bad. It's just there. It, the co problems are so much more complex than they appear on the surface. So, I'll say it again. Thank you. Uh, cool. Yeah, Dave may have to step away. Uh, let's see. Other thoughts on that. Chris, is that useful as we paint this picture? I think it confirms that we definitely have a couple points that um, we've been talking about already, like the state management. And obviously, state management is something to you know dig deeper into it. But as you rightfully point out, it's it's not something that I, I don't I don't see state management as you know the single item that is the minimum viable product. Because it's it probably not. either going to be too complex, or it's going to be um, not really answering the, the 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 overarching problem set. Let's say. Uh, so, state management or state tracking uh, isn't what you want. It's the infrastructure you need to build on top to get what you want. So it's the yeah, boring it plumbing stuff. You have to get right, which just has to work and be there and be solved and not hacked around with, yeah, I can put Paul here and I can also, can abuse this state change to really mean something else has also changed and stuff like this. Uh, the, the, not, the problem is why a lot of this, I think, hasn't moved forward for a decade or so is that so much is possible if you know how in in hacky ways. And uh, but a lot of time the proper solution of not just having to hack around or having to have a, a five star cron job pull something. Uh, yeah, other problem. Where the next level, up, the easy to use part, isn't done because you can't abstract over these hacks because they're so leaky. You can't abstract over them and provide an easy to use and reason about abstraction because you're exposed to the hackiness of things at every step of the way when something doesn't work perfectly. And you can also solve it again if you know what has happened, but not in a way that you would even trust your one-shot shell script to repair it because it means like destroying the set of this data set recursively with dash uppercase RF. Stuff like that. I think the problem set is way more complicated in jails than it is really for Beehive, in my opinion. At least that is my impression at the moment because when we look at Beehive, you know, you have a problem set in terms of what is the configuration of the VM that you give the Beehive. And yes, there can be failures and problems with that. Um, once it's running, it can have failure states when it exits, which is also kind of a difficult problem. But at least, just yeah. like you indicated, you're not going to be you're not going to be deleting CFS uh, uh, volumes or, or or data sets. And from the state tracking point of view, B 
we have is a lot simpler because the virtual machine yeah. uh, is the interface. Yeah. So you're virtualizing over a very limited hardware interface. It's implemented in mostly software with hardware acceleration, but you are basically simulating main memory, CPU cores, block storage, and Ethernet interfaces. And if you and if you say reports, and then the nasty thing is PCI pass through, but let's ignore that for a second. Everything else has a very intentionally limited interface between host and uh, guest. So that is the advantages of virtual machines that you don't have the, uh, it's a black box, it's not a white box. You can't look inside in a meaningful way, which also means that there isn't any awareness or complexity which has to be managed because it's a dumped down machine interface. Um, there the problem is uh, I'm mostly getting correctness and performance right. With jails, you can do so much more nuance and detailed stuff. And this is why you can spend forever on it and just tinker around in your nerd cave. Um, because yeah, it's such a, you have basically the system, whole system call interface again to mess around with and do clever, intricate details with, but yeah, see, this is this is this is the thing that I, I'm 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 not able to wrap my head around at the moment because I think one of the one of the benefits and the strengths of GLs is really that, and I think this is also probably one of the reasons why people start uh, building their own kind of management tooling around GLs because they figure, hey, plus D is great, but I want to do this and that and this and that, and it's just not in there. So they start, you know, building and building and building, and it's kind of as you as you rightfully point out, it's it's you know the inner geek comes out, and you can do and build it just the way you want it. And That's one while time. with Beehive, you can you can build a template for I don't know Windows VM, and it's going to work for ninety percent of the cases. If you do this for for if you try this for GLs, you're not going to be successful, I think, because most people will just say I don't like that. One of the reasons why there are so many jail managers are, and why we are all slightly different is that there are so many options and a lot of them are sensible for several use cases, but supporting all of them in a user-friendly way without just becoming the next uh, shell script runtime um, is uh, it's just too much of an effort. So basically everyone takes what's there and then abstracts of the subset they care about. And you can pick so many different subsets because you have so many things at your disposal. And if you don't need VNet and you don't need, uh, or you don't need any network virtualization, you may just set it to inherit because you only care about running different versions of your application in your CI pipeline. And you don't care about any network or storage virtualization other than your working directory. And sure, that basically is something like uh, yeah, Bayport or some other execution environment. Uh, maybe there's a static jail outside because again, it can be recursive. Or you want to run only PHP applications on your a uh, hosting network where you have enough at least IPv6 address space so that everything gets a static uh, address internally uh, and then you are fine with alias networking or you want to basically have the virtual machine, uh, the jails feel like fully featured virtual machines so that you can rent them out as let's say a managed root server of sorts and you want your users to tinker with most things, then yeah, you have completely different requirements. You care more about noisy neighbors and which features do I have to be careful with so that I don't have guest escapes. And Jan, you're giving me flashbacks here. And so far as with early Beehive, it's like the networking people want super sophisticated networking with VLANs and VNet and you name it, you name it. 
And when you ask them about storage, they're like, oh, just make it work. And then the storage people want a super complex ZFS structure and this, that, and that. And then if you have the fancy networking, the net storage people ask, like, why is the networking so complex on this thing? Well, all the networking people wanted that and they consider it easy and they're kind of competing interests. Um, and then what the new user really wants is something which is easy to uh, integrate in an existing network uh, with local storage. So they just want something to work, maybe have a global configuration file, put in an, a list of IP ranges for this host, and then the jail manager to pick an alias IP from that so that you get great networking performance. And it just works because you have allocated these 100 or so IP addresses to this host out of your, let's say, slash 16 internal IPv4 network uh, behind your NAT. And then, yeah. And everything yeah, gets... the question is how much, how much of how much of an enterprise user is going to fit into that picture? I, I imagine yes. not many enterprise users are going to have those easy instances, you know? No, but first of all, other than the existing enterprise users, if you want to grow them, you have to make it easy to get onboarded. You can't say, uh, yeah, you have to read 100,000 lines of source code in seven different languages. Uh, to understand how to use it. And the other part is that you, um, once you really limit yourself to only the enterprises, you get something like the dreaded uh, enterprise uh, grade software, where you need a PhD in JVM uh, garbage collection exactly. flags. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, just so that you get same day uh, search results, yeah. stuff like that, and uh, yeah, this really, this is the you can probably count the users who really need all of that, uh, just on your uh, fingers. Yeah, they have these use cases. We should really think about the. Uh, the five people uh, team instead of the 500 people team. And make it possible to join this team without having to uh, share a cubicle with a gray beard for uh, a decade. Right, so it's... it's... I, I... Go ahead. I, I, can, I, can, I can completely, I can completely relate. Um, I've, I've had that in the past that I converted uh, a Linux stack at, at one company to, to FreeBSD. And one of the arguments there was really, as you pointed out, you know, having having this conversion and onboarding set in a manner that was understandable to also the, the, the existing subject matter experts. And what, what kind of convinced the team, uh, at least in my uh, perception in the end, was the availability of jails in, in conjunction with with resource accounting, because that kind of gave the stability that you would not be getting if you were using Docker. You know, if, if one container exhausts your resources, you're screwed. And you can build your system with resource accounting in a manner that this will not happen. And you're absolutely right. If you if you can build something, if we can build something that kind of gives users an easy way into something like that, then, hey, by all means, I think we've got a killer feature. Uh, so one of the things, there's basically two things I want to focus on. And that is that just because the complex things or the powerful things are possible doesn't mean they should be so hard that basically they take up all your technical debt uh, budget because you have this complex, hard to use tooling you came up with yourself and now you can't don't have the ability to just upstream that somewhere and have it be maintained. Instead, you're now busy locked into your tech tree uh, in an RPG sense, and you can only basically spend more there. And you have to keep that around, maintain it, extend it, debug it. 
which means that while you can use it like that, you're spending too much effort for what you're getting. The other problem is that if you have truly this software which where everything is just an option, uh, and basically, yeah, you write a, a Jinja template to emit a YAML file, which configures an uh, XML uh, engine, which then just does something, and in the end, it happens to be materialized in some document database, which then is, well, and so on. You get these uh, stacks, which yeah, look like, I don't know, Kubernetes with Helm and so on. Maybe with, uh, what's this engine? Uh, I forgot the name for the, um, you can even have it basically monitor a Git repository and uh, automatically apply new Helm charts and so so that you can do everything yeah. like it. And yes, it's impressive what you can do and this uh, to get to as far close as possible to true uh, um, code is everything stuff. But in the end, it only works because you're building on top of someone else's cloud. And the other problem is that it's so complex. If anything breaks in there, you can't debug it anymore. Yep, I'll quickly throw in one more anecdote from the good old days, which was like, okay, so how do you want the management to work? Oh, exactly like the one we used at the last job. Like, okay, did you enjoy it? Oh, no, it's horrible, but we know it. Like, no, oh, not helpful. So I think this is one more, one more argument to, to find, you know, uh, a subspace of the problem space that we're looking at because if we attempt to build this you know tiger product that does everything then we're going to be busy defining stuff for the next 10 years and uh, never get anything done so um, in that respect i completely agree with the um with the suggestion you know place this up into something that we can start with and I keep coming back at the at, at the state management. I don't know, um, probably because I understand it the best. I don't I don't know, um, but I'm I'm open for suggestions. If if you think there's other areas where we can dig into, then I'd love to hear it. So, one way I would like this uh, tooling to look is just install a package, uh, and then you have the Ansible modules for it, and Ansible is a good example of how things can be done right in that regard because it's easy to get started. Yes, it needs a bit of mental uh, model understanding, but once you have the mental model in which can be done in an hour with the, if someone has any familiarity with Unix like systems and the administration and someone guiding them through a few examples and the sky is the limit as to what you can do with it. But the problem is that it gets slow if you use too many uh, steps. So what we need is basically powerful enough Ansible modules for jail-related work. Um, so that you don't have to build your jail one line of one file at a time, but at a high, higher abstraction level. These are the file systems I want inside my jail. And then the second per uh, Ansible task isn't so bad. How is Ansible licensed? Is that is that that's from from Red Hat IBM, right? Can't yeah, remember, it is uh, IBM slash Red Hat. But uh, the thing is, you can have your own modules, and it's an intended use case. I have to check the license exactly, and. It, I just mean the base as well. I don't mean Ansible Apache 2. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I thought I was reading something uh, recently about Ansible and, and, and licensing. Maybe I'm, I don't know. IBM did a bunch of uh, screwy things with licenses, and that, but that was mostly around centers. And yes, uh, can be a problem. But oh, no, uh, the base uh, Ansible stuff is uh, GPL free. All right. OK. Yeah. But okay. again, that's not much of a problem unless you have a problem running anything under that license in your stack. If you have your modules 
in another very liberal license, ISC, BSD, whatever. Um, but they're probably not useful outside that ecosystem. I could be wrong. Um, so uh, that's all good food for thought, and I'm not sure we'll solve it today, but please do all think about that over the coming days and weeks. And we've been joined by Emmanuel. Would you like to introduce yourself? No pressure if you don't, or your mic's not working or otherwise. Oh, thank you, Vian. Yes, no pressure. Uh, but I'm pleased to report we've had at brief moments nearly a dozen people here. So that said, we've covered some very good ground. Uh, some of these topics can be pushed to Friday, although Dave might not be able to join on Friday. But don't never ever stress about not being able to attend. Hopefully the recordings make up for that and you can watch at your leisure. Uh, I would love to talk ACL models on the ZFS call in a few hours, if that's cool for those who celebrate. What is and, the call on ahead. Friday? I've been I've been away. What's the call on Friday? So uh, D -D 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 Doug R, who has a bunch of OCI framework progress, cannot meet during this time slot. So okay. yeah. the, the thought is to discuss that between a few of us what can be done with OCI where they're at even if it's a simple introduction uh Chris I think Doug's name came up a few times on the uh various uh, OCI things so it's like well let's engage uh 10 people uh, Yana are you asking for a link for that meeting yes I'm quick, but not that quick. I need to, We at the start of the call, we kind of agreed to go that route. So uh, okay. uh, let's, if it's you, Antrenig and I, shall we talk process supervision outside the context of this kind dozen people? Sure, we uh, can just, uh, um, from now on, we're nodding away. And Emmanuel, any, any, uh, anything to say? Any questions, any introduction? You can have the floor if you want it. If you want to be a fly on the wall, no worries. Levi, any questions? No, sir. Good work, guys. Shall we call the official call there? Sorry about the overloading of those words in English. Uh, and then maybe stick around for a little bit if as needed. Well, out of respect for the Jamies and Dans of the world, I'm going to call it if there's nothing else to discuss. But I thank you all and uh, have a great remainder of the week. All right. Thank you. Thank you.